Hi, everyone. My name is Philbert. I'm the program officer of the film and audiovisual programs at the Japan Foundation Toronto. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that we are showing three films about the Ainu people from the late great ethnological filmmaker Himeda Tadayoshi. Uh, Dr. Marco Centeno will be discussing these films in tonight's presentation. Uh, the films will be screened online and will be available across North America for free from Friday, September 2nd to Sunday, September 4th. Uh, please register on our website at jftor.org. I would also like to acknowledge that the office at the Japan Foundation Toronto is located on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, we welcome viewers from all across these lands we call Canada and the United States of America, which is home to many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and numerous diverse Indigenous peoples. We encourage you to seek out the resources to reflect the land that you are on, your relationship with the land, and who the traditional keepers of the land are. Now, we also have a link to a very short questionnaire for this event. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you can fill it out. Uh, your feedback means a lot to us, and it helps us with our future programming. Uh, I will be back later for a Q&A session with Dr. Centeno after the presentation. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to our executive director, Yuko Shimizu, uh, to introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening and konbanwa minasama. I am Yuko Shimizu, the executive director of the Japan Foundation Toronto. Thank you for tuning in to a very special virtual JFT lecture. Last month, we hosted online screenings about the Ainu, the indigenous people of Ainu Moshiri in northern Japan, also known today as Hokkaido. Today, we continue our recognition of the Ainu people as we celebrate one of Japan's most important ethnological filmmakers, Himeda Tadayoshi. In his career spanning half a century, director Himeda made more than 120 films documenting the lives and cultures of common people and communities. During the 1970s and the 1980s, director Himeda created a series of seven documentaries in close collaboration with the late Ainu trailblazer, Kayano Shigeru. Mr. Kayano is a key figure of Ainu movement and one of the last native speakers of the Ainu language, who became the first Ainu to sit in the Japanese parliament in 1994. Director Himeda made these films following the daily activities of Mr. Kayano in his hometown of Biratori to help shine a truthful light on the lives of the Ainu and more importantly, to portray them in a non-exotic and non-primitive way. The partnership between director Himeda and Mr. Kayano marked a significant shift in Ainu representation. Walking us through director Himeda's career is Dr. Marco Centeno, the Japanese program director of Burbeck, University of London. Dr. Centeno is a lecturer and academic in Japanese studies with a wealth of international experience, whose research revolves around documentary film, representation of minorities, particularly the Ainu people, and post-war avant-garde, just to name a few. His research project, Japanese Transnational Cinema, has been funded by Sasakawa and Daya Foundations, Waseda, and the Japanese Ministry of Education. His work on the representation of the Ainu people has received several prizes, including his full-length documentary film, Ainu Pathways to Memory, which has been translated into several languages. We are delighted to have Dr. Centeno today to show us the significance of one of Japan's most unsung filmmakers and to serve as a perfect introduction to our three online screenings of director Himeda's Ainu films. Thank you once again. And now, please allow me to welcome our speaker, Dr. Marco Centeno. Thank you very much for inviting me, uh, uh, Philbert, to, to this exciting series of events. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, well, the title of my presentation is, as you can see on the slide, uh, Reviving Ainu Lost Traditions on the Screen, that is Jimena's documentary films. Um, <clears throat> well, I am a, a, I am a, a, a film person my, myself, my research interest uh, revolve around documentary films and representation of minorities. I have been working 
on the Ainu people for a while. I had the opportunity of studying Ainu culture and language at Waseda University in Tokyo. And I, I, I came to know the, the Ainu community uh, living in, in Hokkaido and, uh, and outside of Hokkaido. And I, I, and I wrote um, uh, uh, several <clears throat> pieces on the film representation of Ainu people. And I made a documentary on the, on the problems of, of preserving and promoting Ainu culture today. You have some references uh, here on the slide. Um, um, so today, today I'd like to focus on on Tadayoshi Himeda, particularly. Uh, well, he he made, he made five films during the 1970s, and I'm going to focus on the first three that he made alongside the Ainu leader Shigeru Kayano. So, um, so uh, as you can see, I I will divide my presentation into five topics that I, I intend to cover today. First, a, a brief introduction to Ainu culture, then uh, an overview of the film representation of the Ainu. Third, the images that have been imposed on Ainu people in the 1960s and 70s. Then I will, I will touch on the context of the 1970s and the revival of the Ainu movement, uh, in which we can find Tadayoshi Himeda. And then, so at, at the end, we will focus on uh, bullet point number five, on the responses uh, proposed by Tobias Jimeda and, and Shigeru Kayano in this, uh, in this three, uh, uh, the, the three film, the three first films in which they collaborated, the wedding ceremony of the Ainu, Chisei Akara, we build our house, and Iomante Bear Ride. Um, okay, um, just a brief introduction. I mean, I, I'm sure most of you have some ideas already about who the Ainu people are. Um, uh, I just I, I just uh, put on the slide um, some data which uh, which illustrates the the recent interest uh, in the Ainu people um, uh, in Japan. In two thousand and eight, uh, the Ainu people were uh, finally recognized as the, the indigenous people of Japan. It's quite recent; uh, it's uh, <clears throat> almost uh, a decade. Ago, so it, so the fact that we consider them as the indigenous people of Japan is quite recent, and it was accepted by the Japanese Diet on one year after uh, the United Nations passed the draft declaration on the rights of the indigenous peoples. Um, and then we've got uh, a new Ainu law in 2019, which was uh, passed before the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games. So uh, it was a, a policy in order to show abroad that the Japanese government was engaged in promoting uh, 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 minorities this, this, uh, uh, in face of this long-standing criticism of uh, uh, towards the, uh, the Japanese government of, uh, of neglecting the existence of, of minorities in Japan. Um, so, um, well, who the, um, the Ainu people, as you can see here, uh, um, they look like these pictures were taken in the Meiji period. Um, uh, and people tend to think because of because of this idea that they, they were they were finally recognized as, as as indigenous people. People people tend to think of the Ainu as an indigenous indigenous minority. However, I would claim that it's more accurate to talk about uh, uh, the Ainu as a culture, uh, or we can talk about Ainu as a minority, as a demographic or social minority. Ethnographic minority, ethnic minority, is a bit difficult or problematic because the Ainu have been mixed with the Japanese for a long time, for many centuries. So if we if we keep in mind the idea of Ainu as a culture, we would, uh, we would need to consider that the Ainu, just like any other culture in the world, are not uh, isolated boxes. Cultures are never isolated boxes. They always interact with other cultures, they develop. So we can say that the Ainu culture was developed uh, from 15th century or even before uh, from Satsumon culture, developed from the 7th and to the 14th century. And also, uh, well, I do culture as, as something developed from the 15th century. And also, it's a culture that interacted with, or is the result of the interactions with Oho, the cultures that were developed around Ohosk Sea, that you can see on the slide, uh, the uh, Satsumon culture that was coming from the south. And also, is uh, is the culture that that resulted from the uh, interactions with the Japanese if from the 15th uh, 15th, 15th century uh, 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 an increasing number of mer Japanese merchants that were being settled in in the southern part of Hokkaido so 
So uh, Ainu culture as the result of these interactions, a culture that was developed from previously existing cultures, but also interacting with other peoples uh, or other neighboring peoples. Um, something different happened in Meiji period, which is a heavy and intensive assimilation to Japanese culture that had, had been initiated by Tokugawa shogunate uh, in, in the first half of the 19th century, but it was intensified by the Meiji government uh, in, from the second half of the 19th century, uh, which implemented a, uh, an active policy for the modernization and assimilation of Ainu people to Japan. Um, so the second bullet point number two is film representation. So while all this assimilation of the Ainu people to Japanese culture was taking place in Meiji period, uh, we have ironically um, uh, a European fascination for the Ainu. So on the one hand, the Ainu were being assimilated to Japanese culture in Japan, but in, in Europe, people were, uh, uh, European audiences were fascinated by the Ainu. Uh, why? Why? Where is this fascination coming from? Well, um, as you can see in the previous slides, um, the Ainu were physically different from the Asian neighbors. So when Japan opened its borders in Meiji period, uh, we've got a number of explorers, adventurers, travelers who reached, reached Hokkaido and they encountered the Ainu people. Uh, and they created this myth, 19th century kind of ideas in which they claimed that the Ainu were kind of the, the uh, Caucasian people, white people, lost in the Far East. Particularly, this myth was quite popular in, in the German-speaking areas, in, in, the, in the former Prussia, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, because they claimed that the, the Ainu might have been the missing link between the old ancient Germanic tribes and the first inhabitants of the Asian continent. So it is not surprising that in Meiji period, when the cinematograph, the, the, the cinema, Arrived in Japan in 1896. Uh, in the in the earliest 33 sequences ever shot in Japan, we can find the Ainu in two of them. Uh, and you can see on the slide uh, some stills of these two sequences that were shot among the er very earliest uh, uh, moving images ever ever filmed in Japan by uh, the, fr the French operator Constant Girel, who worked for Lumiere Brothers, who were Lumiere Brothers, as you know, were the inventors of, of, of the cinematograph. And from that point, uh, during the 15th, the early 20th century, we've got representations of the Ainu people in films quite frequently. Uh, first in the actualities, they were sort of like kind of short, so mean one minute, uh, uh, of so one minute films, very short, and then the, they were developed into the travelogues or travel documentaries, which, which became popular in the 1910s and 1920s. Um, and in these films, we, we repeatedly have kind of a, simi a similar kind of iconography in which they insisted in this idea of the Ainu as a fast vanishing race. Uh, 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 a, a, a race of people that were which were becoming extinct. However, uh, if we look, the contradiction is that if we look at the population of the statistics, the population of the time remained more or less stable. So what's going on here? Uh, what happened was that uh, the explorers, these travelers, they had the impression that the, the Ainu were a vanishing race, a vanishing people, people who were becoming extinct. But what, what was going on here was that they were being assimilated to Japanese culture. And that's why they had the impression that they were extinct, but they, or they were invisible because they were just uh, modernized. They were being part of the, of the uh, Japanese society. In, in the post-war representations of the, uh, of the Ainu people, uh, we have this idea that the Ainu became a pejorative term uh, related to you know this idea of being savages, and they were targeted for mockery. And in the in the representations that were led by the film industry, but also by the tourist agencies, the Ainu people had very had very little control over the, their representation. So we've got an iconography in the 1960s and 70s that had been imposed on the Ainu from the outside. Um, in the post-war period, we've got, you know, uh, uh, um, 
cold, the Cold War, Japan falls into the uh, sphere of influence of the US. So American popular culture was widely spread. And uh, Hokkaido was represented quite often as the America as the Japanese Far West. And uh, likewise, the, the Ainu were like the equivalent of the Native American. So we've got these romantic images uh, of the Ainu echoing the, the iconography of the Native Americans. And we've, had, we've got an example, for example, in entertainment cinema in the Watari Dori series starring Akira Kobayashi, in which we've got the, this representation of the Ainu uh, with, with, with no Ainu actors, so they are played by Japanese actors and actresses. Um, and but, but echoing this iconography of the American Native Americans, um, the tourist industry also uh, was reinforcing or promoting this uh, this imaginary, this iconography of the Ainu. Um, so insisting is in this idea of trying to uh, try to attract uh, tourists to the nature of Japan, but using also the Ainu as an, as an element. as an appealing element for tourists. But sometimes they use also uh, uh, offensive. Uh, 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 messages such as the one that you can see on the slide in which they are uh, inviting tourists to see uh, the famous or uh, uh, the famed Heiri Ainu uh, as you can see uh, in, in, on the text and that was uh, criticized by the Ainu community they were denounced and there was a trial and eventually this, uh, this uh, the tourist agency had to uh, publish uh, uh, their, their apologies um, so the Ainu, uh, so the, in the 1960s, more uh, 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 more radical in the 70s, the Ainu became more aware of the of, of their representation, and they criticized several. They had to counteract three narratives. First, these idealized images created by the film industry that neglected the stigmatization and the, and the discrimination that they were going through. Second, they were crit criticizing the false and denigrating tourist representation, sometimes festivals that were taking place in Hokkaido from the 1960s, which uh, projected a, a, a twisted image of, of, of the Ainu. And third, they had to criticize or counteract the official discourses uh, by the Japanese government claiming that in Japan there were no uh, minorities. And whenever they were, the Japanese government was, was asked whether, whether, whether they respected the minorities in the country, they would reply that they did because Japan was homogeneous and there were there were no minorities in Japan. Um, that was usually the response of the time by the prime ministers, as you can see on the slide. Um, so in the 1960s, we in the 1970s, we find ourselves in a different context. Uh, we've got a revitalization of the Ainu movement and the Ainu associations, such as the, as you can see on the slide, the Peure Utari no Kai, the Young Comrades Association, Tokyo Utari Kai, an association of the Ainu people in Tokyo, and the Ainu Kaho Domei or Ainu Liberation League, um, which were more politically engaged, so to say. And also, we've got a, a proliferation of new self conscious festivals, which were trying to make uh, the Ainu people more visible in the history of Hokkaido. So we've got, for example, the, Ainu, the Sakushain Festival, uh, which was created in 1970, and they, when they, where they established the a memorial for Sakusain, and you know, an Ainu leader who raised a, a, a revolt against the, uh, the Matsumai clan, the Japanese authority in southern Hokkaido in the 17th century. And then the Ikarpa, another, another fe annual festival, uh, which remembering uh, the Kunashi Menashira uprising in the 18th century, and then the, the Ainu flag was created in the early 1970, 19, yeah, 1970s, 1973. And then we've got a very the publication of the significant journal, uh, uh, Anotari Ainu, or We Humans, that was published between 1973 and 1976, which was key to disseminate these uh, 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 ideas about the Ainu Mosir or the Ainu land and, and develop this self-consciousness uh, on, uh, on the status of the Ainu as a, as a discriminated and a stigmatized minority. Um, in this context, uh, simultaneously, there is a crisis in visual anthropology. So filmmakers doing uh, ethnographic films like uh, Tadayoshi Himeda became engaged in this shift in within uh, visual anthropology 
and raising the question of whose story is it, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Uh, they became aware or increasingly aware that traditionally documentary films were projecting uh, images created by the filmmaker or were highlighting or yeah, projecting the voice, the filmmaker's voice, rather than the voices of the people in front of the camera. So we can what we can see usually in traditional images of the eye were these kind of uh, images of the primitive uh, or, or, you know, primitive savages uh, seen through the eyes of a filmmaker uh, or media, images mediatized by the author of a film. Uh, and then filmmakers became aware that eventually ethnographic films are actually an encounter, an, an encounter of two cultures, the culture of the filmmaker and the culture of the people uh, uh, being uh, filmed on the screen. Um, so in this context is where, where Tadayoshi Himeda comes and, and plays an important role for, for a, 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 and, a, and becomes a, a turning point in the representation of the Ainu people. Um, well, Himeda was, had been very influenced by, by the folklore scholar Miyamoto Tsuneichi, uh, and he collaborated together in, in, in educational TV documentaries, such as in the Nihon no Siyo, the Japan's poetry, in the 1960s, in which they filmed the folklore of, uh, Ainu of Japanese villages uh, all across the Japanese archipelago from Okinawa to Hokkaido. And in Hokkaido is when in 1968, Tadayoshi Himeda meets the, uh, the famous Ainu leader, Shigeru Kayano. Shigeru Kayano was the, the first Ainu to, to sit in the Japanese diet, in the Japanese parliament. Uh, and he plays an, a very important role for the promotion and dissemination of Ainu culture in the second half of the 20th century. So Tadayoshi Himeda and Shigeru Kayano developed this alliance in which they collaborated in a, a number of writing and filmic activities, including the, the shooting of five films between 1971 and 1979. Uh, eventually, Tadeusz Himeda became one of the, probably the most renowned uh, ethnographic filmmaker in Japan. He, ma he made more than 100 films capturing the folklore cultures uh, across Japan, not only Hokkaido. And, and he developed a close relationship to the characters, the people uh, in front of the camera. Uh, so a close gaze to, to these cultures, they project in the spirituality and the links between the culture and nature. Uh, and, and, and his documents became, his, his documentary films became a very valuable documents because he captured events that were not available anymore anymore uh, and, uh, and, they, and he preserved them on, on the screen uh, on, on, on films. He founded the Minsoku Bunka Iso Kenkyuyo or the Laboratory for uh, Ethnographic Film Culture um, and he also made films outside of Japan. He developed this collaboration from 1975 with the French anthropologist Jacques Soufier who was interested in Ainu people and in 19, uh, 1977 he visit, visits France and he, together with uh, Jacques Soufier, made films on, on Basque culture and, Catal and Catalan culture in, in southern France. Um, well, so as I said before, um, <clears throat> Tadayoshi Himeda represents a, a turning point in the history of uh, representation of the Ainu people. Rather than uh, projecting this image of Ainu as a, as a, a primitive thrive, isolated from the modern world. Uh, he uh, presents Ainu, like a, a, a more honest representation of the Ainu community as modern people who, who, who live like any other Japanese uh, citizen and who are assimilated to Japanese culture and to whom uh, Ainu culture are is an unknown culture. They are a, a alien to their own culture. So here projects for the first time the contradiction of this generation, which I, which from the 1970s are making big efforts for to for the recovery of their culture. Uh, but ironically, they have become outsiders uh, of of this culture. So this is an interesting contradiction that can be seen in, in his films. So he projects on the screen the problem of this cultural assimilation to the forefront, something that was missing in, in previous representations. And, and, and he highlights this identity crisis while, while he feels the recovery of, of these former traditions. 
he is highlighting as well uh, the problem of assimilate of the cultural assimilation and and and, and identity crisis. So I am going to revolve. Uh, I am going to I am going to discuss these these problems around this uh, around this the first three films that uh, Tadushi Himeda made alongside Shigeru Kayano, uh, The Wedding Ceremony of the Ainus, and then Chisiakar, and then uh, Yomande Dimse. And I will show you some clips uh, from, some, from, from, from them. All of these are the films that the Japan Foundation uh, are, uh, are screening within this series. Um, well, the, the wedding ceremony was the the first uh, the first film that that, that Tadayoshi Himeda made together with Shigeru Kayano. Uh, it's a very important document because the an Ainu wedding had never been before uh, filmed before, uh, so it's a, a really valuable document uh, in which we've got the representation of a, a certain elements that uh, and rituals that have. Ne had never been documented before. Um, uh, so, uh, 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 in some of them were like, uh, have been uh, explained by, for example, Neil Gordon Monroe, the, the Scottish physician who lived with the in the 1950s, in 1930s, sorry. Uh, but there were no visual document for this. Um, so, and the, why the, uh, this is something important is because the I know wedding ceremonies were not being performed anymore. Uh, so the Ainu, the Ainu committee didn't know uh, how an Ainu and a wedding ceremony would look like, and this the, and the reason why that happened was because because of the mixed races, the bullet point number two, and also because uh, the wish of the Ainu to hide their ethnic identity to, to to avoid discrim discrimination and stigmatization. Um, so the the film features common people the. Um, the who speak Japanese language and who have like ordinary jobs. The 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 bride is a farmer and the and the, and the group and the groom is uh, works in a in a in a in a car repair shop. Um, so they are not particularly like uh, special people. They are ordinary people who are who are insisting that they want to have a a, 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 a wedding ceremony in the Ainu style. So they. They call Shigeru Kayano and they they ask him to to prepare an Ainu ceremony for them. Um, so what we see uh, on the on the on the film, as you can see on bullet point number four, is that they are individuals who are aware of the cultural assimilation and they try to counteract it. Um, um, so unlike previous films, some also films made in uh, TV documentaries made in the 1950s, which were claiming for Equality among the Japanese and the Ainu. Uh, this this film is different because the goal is to make difference visible. So rather than the previous films uh, uh, insisting that the Ainu should be equal to the Japanese and they should, that's why they should be integrate and be uh, and be uh, well yeah integrate to the Japanese culture because they are equal. This is insisting in the difference. And so it's a significant uh, a significant new approach. So it becomes a valuable document, as I said before, because it shows very known traditions, such as the, the unke, uh, a band uh, that uh, that was used uh, for for uh, for chastity and ma ma maturity of Ainu women, and this is a, a a tradition that you can see the band here that it is transmitted from generation to generation uh, from women uh, to their daughters. And it is something that it is it was a, a sec a secret kept by by Ainu women. Uh, Neil Gordon Monroe who in the 1930s, who had a clinic in in Hokkaido, had had reported this 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 tradition uh, in in his in his writings. But this is the first visual document on this on this tradition. Um, and the other one is. Uh, but, there's, uh, but there are some, some other elements. But the other one uh, I'd like to show you is the um, uh, the ritual a ritual to the to rice a rice ritual which was not documented by the Japanese before, which shows uh, a significant shift in which the Ainu people are I taking a more active role in the wrong representation. Um, uh, so maybe we can, uh, uh, Philbert, maybe we can show the first and second clip. 
飯食の始まりは花嫁と花婿の飯食いであるウエペケレの中にこんな一節がある私たちの村で一緒になる女と結婚することになりましたその女は本当にきれいに手を洗い体も清めてそして鍋にご飯を炊いたそれに赤いお膳と赤いご飯を添えてご飯を持ってくれたので私はそれを半分食べて半分寄せてあげたそしたらそれを押しいただき食べ終わりましたそして私たちは仲良く暮らしておりましたひとつの椀に盛られた山盛りの飯を分け合って食べるこの飯食いの儀式がアイヌの結婚式の焦点である江戸時代の終わり頃内地人によって描かれたアイヌの結婚の絵には式らしい式は何もない<笑>アイヌが最も好きな踊り「トリッパ」今まで座っていた人も次々に立って加わる。佳子さんがアイヌの結婚式をやりたいと言い出した時彼女の周りの人々は猛烈に反対したそして反対しない人でも果たしてそんなことができるのかたとえできるにしても集まってくれる人があるのかと心配したがそれは杞憂であった私ら子供頃でもねこう見た覚えないのさだからもうね珍しいもうだからねあの普通の式あげるこ,れこっちの方が経費かかるんでないかい立派だなと思って見てますみんなにみんなに祝ってもらったらね嫁さんも本当幸せだね上びっくりみたいだね、うん、私らんた38年生まれだから今ね67なんですけどね初めて見たのこういう式を珍しいですよ私らアイヌ人としてこういうこと初めて見たんですから。だから嬉しいですよ今の世の中の若い人らがよくこういう好きでやるか気になったと思ったら感心してます Thank you very much, Philbert. So,、um, um, so this, this film is very interesting because the Ainu voices have been traditionally neglected in the representation. However, Tadayashi Himeda is, is highlighting these voices of the Ainu people and projecting on the screen their own concerns. Uh, uh, um, and their own, their own worries. And also, we can see, we can hear on the background uh, uh, a w e b e r g e r being uh, uh, recited in a new language and, and translated and explained by Sigiru Kayano.、Um, so, um, this is, uh, uh, and also, we've got this, the representation of, 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 of new kind of、uh, elements in the ritual that were not documented before.、Um, And another interesting point in the, in the, in, in the film is that,、um, well, not only that the Ainu are, 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 becoming a, are, are having an, an active role in the representation, but also the point that、uh, the recovery, rather than of the Ainu identity, a h i m e d a is also very interested in the recovery of this pride, of the Ainu pride, which is what, what、uh, the, 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 the woman on the soundtrack is talking about.、Um, the second film that、um, that a l a y o s e h i m e d a made alongside uh, uh, Sigiru Kayano was Chisi Akar, Akar, or Akara. We built our house,、uh, made in 1974, and it's about、uh, the traditional building of, of a house and a granary in Biratori, in Nibutani, in a, in, a, in a village, in this village 
which has a, a, a majority of Ainu inhabitants. Um, the last time that the, that uh, uh, an Ainu an Ainu house Chise had been built was in 1948. So the goal of this, according to Shigeru Kayano, the goal of this uh, event was not so much the, the construction of, of the of this traditional Chise or the Ainu house as such, but creating footage. Uh, filming the, the, the process of building the house and creating footage that could work as educational material to teach these techniques of, of building uh, of, of building Chise for the future generations. So in other words, uh, the film should outlive the materiality of the house as such. Uh, um, and, and it's very interesting that on the soundtrack, like in the previous film, we've got a dialogue between uh, Jimeda and Shigeru Kayano. Jimeda renounces to speak on behalf of the Ainu. Um, he's aware of, of, of previous representations in which the filmmaker is imposing his own view uh, on the Ainu people. So he is able to, to develop this close gaze to the Ainu community and the tradition through Ka Shigeru Kayano. Uh, the member of the of the Ainu community, and Shigeru Kayano explains not only the technical process of, of building the house, but also the spiritual nature of, of the house, all the the meaning and the and the symbolism related to the different parts of the house, um, and also uh, some, once the, the the house is is finished, they also film the so called the Chisenomi or the house warming ceremony. Uh, Holst Warning Ceremony had been already uh, filmed by um, the Scottish physician that I have talked about before, uh, Neil Gordon Monroe. Uh, um, and it was a ceremony that had been performed or, or, or led by Shigeru Kayano's father, uh, uh, Seitaro Kayano, uh, uh, 40 years before. Um, so, um, uh, Phil, maybe if we can if we can see the the clip that we have prepared for this film, in which this clip belongs to the Chisenomi, uh, the housewarming ceremony. Once the the, the house was uh, was was already uh, uh, built. <laughs> ね<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> やるから、これ。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ちゃんと。ち
Uh, also, the, the son of uh, Sigiru Kayano was engaged in, in the production of documentary films on uh, on the Ainu, on Ainu tradition, traditions in the 1990s. So the the family, the grandfather Hayano and, and his son, played an important role for for documenting these traditions. Uh, in the case of Iomante, Iomante Rimse, the beer ceremony is uh, one of the most representative uh, ceremonies ceremonies uh, of the Ainu culture. Uh, it is the 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 sacrifice, the ritual sacrifice of a bear to send back the, its spirit to the mountain. The, in the Ainu, in the Ainu belief, the the bear was uh, considered as the uh, the mountain god. So this 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 ritual was to send back uh, this spirit to the mountains. Um, however, this, this ceremony had been banned uh, already before Meiji period from uh, uh, from the end of, uh, of Tokugawa Shogunate at the end of, sec of from mid 19th century. Uh, the, the, the ceremony as such was uh, pretty much abandoned after World War II. And it was only performed sometimes, but uh, not in its original form, but, on, uh, but for tourist or, uh, and academic purposes. So, in other words, it was being filmed for outsiders, uh, but um, its original form, form and spirituality have been removed. So, unlike previous documentaries, this film presents the Aino as being engaged in this, in this ceremony for themselves. So, it's a more honest uh, ceremony in which they, they, they are performing it for themselves uh, and for their own traditional beliefs. Um, and also, and this is bullet, po bullet point number five. Um, what we can see here is rather than than filmmakers' voice, as in as in, in the previous documentary film made by Monroe in the 1930s, uh, what we can see is the voice of the Ainu people, which is highlighted by mainly by uh, by the voiceover of Sigiru Kayano and the discussion with him. So, if we had in the 1930s this. Um, uh, the film on the Romante Risa with long intertitles in which this, this Scottish uh, uh, filmmaker uh, Monroe provides a long explanation on a, on a written text on the screen. This, is, this text is replaced by the I know voices of Cayano and others who are explaining their own experiences, of how they feel about the ceremony, what they think about it uh, from a modern perspective. Um, so, in other words, we'll put number six. Number six ha, 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 Jimeda is showing the efforts of modern people, rather than exotic, rather than an exotic tribe, trying to recover this ritual, uh, this ritual, and also restoring the the role that the Ainu language plays in it. However, it is showing that Ainu people are not fluent in, a, in Ainu language. In fact, they have forgotten, and most of Ainu of the members of the Ainu community are uh, are not able to speak in Ainu language anymore. So this is also shown in the film, which is very interesting. So we are going to uh, see also two clips. I think they, they last for two minutes. And then I, I will wrap up. Iomante is the ritual of sending the soul of a bear back to the spiritual worlds, the world of the Ainu gods the world of the Kamui. During winter, bears hibernate in caves or hollowed tree trunks, buried under the deep mountain snows, and, come springtime, they bear cubs. The Ainu capture these and raise them for one or two years. It is with these yearling cubs that the Iomante ritual is performed. Nedok 
儀式が始まるぞという晩に、えー、青年たちに、えー、集まってもらってこうやったんですけどまあ、えー、みんながそれやろうという意欲もあったけれども、まあ、寒かったことも,も忘れられないね本当に寒かった普段みんなアイヌ語というものを使わなくなってる人たちですよねそうですねそれがもう本当に覚えようとするその真剣さにむしろ私が引っ張られていったというやらねばならんというそういう気持ちが湧いてきましたね。Well, as you can, and, and, and Seguru Kanyano was able to teach、uh, these,、uh, these prayers to the, to the other members of the community because he was one of the last. Native speakers of Ainu language.、Um, and, as I, and as I said before, this is very interesting because also it shows、uh, rather than exotic images of the Ainu people,、uh, like modern people who are struggling to recover、uh, a, a culture that, has also, that is also unknown for, for them.、Uh, so, as a conclusion, Tadeo Shihimeda marks a, a, a turning point in the history of representations of Ainu people because of this close gaze. To the Ainu people. So he is、uh, moving away from the previous、uh, exotic images of the Ainu as, as, as an isolated、uh, tribe from the modern world. What we can see is contemporary Ainu people who are alien to their own traditions.、Um, also, very interesting that we can see the Ainu voices, mainly in collaboration with Shigeru Kayano, who, who brings this.、Uh, Close view、uh, and, and, and knowledgeable、uh, approach to, 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 tra- to the traditional culture.、Um, and thus,、uh, Himeda is overcoming the traditional distinction between the other and self in ethnographic film.、Uh, he dismantles this fabrication or construction of the otherness、uh, because this other,、um, these exotic people.、Uh, Are not there anymore. What we can see is, is, is Ainu people who are very similar to the rest of the Japanese or to the rest of,、uh, of, of、uh, modern citizens in the global world who are struggling and making efforts to recover this culture, but a culture that they are not familiar with.、Um, another interesting point is that rather than the ethnicity, what Himeda is also interested in is in. Recovering the Ainu pride that had been lost for many, for many years and which had caused this, this cultural tragedy of the loss of Ainu language and Ainu tradition. So, for them, for, for both Shigeru Kayano and Himeda,、uh, it, it, was, it seems that it was key to recover first the Ainu pride in order to be able to recover Ainu traditions.、Uh, and with last, I will leave it here and then. Maybe we can have some、uh, time for questions.、Uh, Philbert? Yes, thank, thank you so much,、uh, Dr. Sensen. That, that, was a, that was a really engaging and insightful presentation.、Um, I'm glad that we can have you here to、um, provide your, your research and your experience and put in context to the three films that we, we will be showing.、Um, with that said,、um, I would like to start off with, with my first question. Um, so, yeah, we, we are screening three of Dr.、Uh, Director Himeda's films this weekend.、Um, and these three films were made in the 1970s,、um, almost half a century ago.、Um, mm-hmm. As we engage with these films, many of us、uh, around North America for the first time, is there another type of otherness that we need to be mindful of、uh, when watching these three films,、um, particularly because it's, it's quite far removed in terms of time? Um, yeah.、Mm. Yeah,、um, that's true. I mean, they, these, these films are, are,、uh, need to be understood in the context of the 1970s, on the, in the context of a revitalization of, 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 of the Ainu culture, and, and in which the Ainu people were very adamant of, of, of having a more Important and active role in the role representation because that has been the, 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 the main problem that, he, that they had to struggle with that being represented by the other, by other, by outsiders,、uh, by foreigners、uh, or, or by other Japanese coming from、uh, outside the Aino community. So,、um, from that perspective, this is the that is probably the 
the, the value of these films made in, in the context of the 1970s. Of course, from from 1970s onwards, there have been other more contemporary representations focusing on there is there are a variety of approaches now to the Ainu to Ainu culture. And even within the Ainu community, there is no consensus of how Ainu culture should be preserved. Some people claim that you know the uh, you could you could perform your you could perform Ainu culture as something more engaged with contemporary or and modern cultures like like you know there are like for example uh, like uh, this Ainu rebels for example is a, a rock and roll band claiming that they you know play uh, Ainu rock and roll uh, while other people are more engaged in traditional culture and now we should you know keep on doing uh, traditional things. Um, so what we are seeing is traditional culture. So the, the recovery of ritual ceremonies that were that have been lost, but ceremonies that, that, that were not part of you know their, their everyday life of the Ainu people. They were living like you know like a common life. They would have a car. They would live in a normal apartment. They would not live in chise in traditional houses anymore. They would live in apartments, modern apartments. So what we see, but but this interesting is that the the attempt of Hide, of Himeda is not showing them as living in traditional life but you know trying to recover to recover this this lost traditional uh, ceremonies um uh, this is a, an approach of 1970s um this uh, and that may vary in, in recently for example we've got documentaries or tokyo ainu for example uh, um, uh, which revolves around the, the activities of the Aino community outside of Hokkaido, uh, for example, the Aino community, the, the activities of this association in Kanto area. So the localization of Aino culture. My documentary, for example, revolves around the preservation of Aino culture outside of Japan, because um, ironically, most of the Aino cultural heritage was preserved in European museums rather than in Japanese museums. Because in Meiji period, as I said before, the Ainu people were being assimilated to Japanese culture. So the uh, European and American explorers visiting Hokkaido were sending back a number of items and objects, material culture. And that that triggered a proliferation of museums in, in Japan. So ironically, many re researchers in Japan on a Ainu a culture, they visit European, they travel all the way to Europe, uh, well, Germany, Poland, Russia as well, uh, Italy, Austria, Switzerland, to visit these collections uh, uh, from Meiji period. So the, the, there are different approaches now to Ainu culture. And also we've got this, uh, probably the audience will be more aware of well, more like modern representations in, in anime, for example, in Golden Kamui, this anime series, um, which focus on a particular historical period, the, 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 uh, the post-war of the Russo-American conflict in 1904-1905. And they are making big efforts, uh, a lot of research to, to portray faithfully Ainu culture. Although there are some, the, 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 what you were saying about the problem of otherness, they still fall, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the effort that the, the efforts that these authors are making to show, I mean, Ainu culture and also the usage of Ainu language. But they also fall into this represent, representation of otherness, the exotic view of the Ainu, in a moment in which actually the Ainu were being assimilated. So we see these characters as being totally Ainu, like dress, uh, dress up like uh, Ainu traditional clothes and speaking Ainu language, but the reality was different. Um, so we, we still have these contradictions of, of showing Ainu people and as, as isolated tribe in a moment in which they were completely Japanized. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned um, Golden Kamui. Uh, that leads into my next question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from a from a North American perspective, um, it seems recently there has been more um, Ainu-based stories or culture in popular media, such as the the 2019 film or the 20, uh, 2019 film uh, Ainu Mushiri which is now on Netflix. Um, and you mentioned the, the manga and anime, Golden Kamui. Um, mm. Do you think that we're experiencing, you know, for good or bad, um, another turning point in Ainu representation in media? Um, kind of like you mentioned when Dr. Himeda and Kaino Shigeru first collaborated, that's that you marked that as a turning point. Um, and was the 2019 uh, new Ainu law a factor um, in that mm. at all? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting question. 
Uh, what I would, what I, my impression is that um, that rather than a turning point in the representation, what I can see is a, a turning point in the consumption consumption of of Ainu culture. So there is a growing interest in Ainu culture. Uh, well, there has been an interest, as I said before, during the major period, late 19th century, early 20th century, but there is a, a revival in this interest, the, the old interest, uh, outside of Japan. And, and that explains why Golden Kamu became, has become like a worldwide uh, famous uh, anime series. Um, and also there is a, a growing interest also within Japan, outside of Hokkaido. This is, this is also interesting. Um, probably this interest, renewed interest, was triggered by the declaration of, of the Ainu as indigenous people of Japan in 2008. So only 10, 15 years ago. And also the, and the new law for the promotion of Ainu culture in 2019. So there is a growing concern uh, or... or uh, or people are more aware that the Ainu people are there, that they exist. They might not have like you know detailed information or, about who they are or, or, or you know about their their traditions, but but at least people know that they are there. And um, and also there is a, a, an increasing number of courses that you can take on Ainu language and culture in Hokkaido, but also outside of Hokkaido. Uh, so I, I would say that there is a turning point in the conception of Ainu culture, in the, in the sense that there, are, there is a, there is a growing interest. Um, I know most of it is also very interesting. It's a very interesting film because it's somehow between reality and fiction because it's a it's a story. It's like it's like a, it's a fictional story, but but using real Ainu people who play themselves somehow. Um, this is also very interesting because traditionally Ainu the Ainu characters were played by Japanese actors. So I would say the Turning point in the sense of consumption, but also from the point of view of the filmmakers, I would say that they have developed a, more like a, a, they are more self-conscious about the problem of representation. So they try to engage in giving giving the Ainu community like a, a voice in the, in the in the narrative. So, for example, in Ainu Mosir, this film was screening in by the Japan no, but it was Daiwa, I think in, in the UK in London uh, last year as well and. And with the filmmaker, and, and he was explaining that he was interested in, in in having the Ainu playing an active role in the representation of of the film and in the narrative. So they were engaged in the discussions. Um, so at some points in the film, they are discussing, for example, the Yoman de Rimsen, Rimsen, whether they should perform the ceremony or not in modern times, because some people are concerned that you know they should not sacrifice a bear for that. Other people claim that they should because but not for the tourist, tourists, but for themselves, in order to preserve their, their ability, their, you know, this, uh, as, a, as a way of, of you know, as, as, a, as a kind of a performance of their belief, find of the Ainu belief. Um, so, uh, and this is a discussion that is taking place among the Ainu community. And the filmmaker is showing that discussion in the film that, that is not necessarily imposed by the filmmaker. So this kind of a more developed uh, self-awareness uh, um, and trying to to give one step back in the representation and allow the idea to have a more active role in the representation is kind of uh, very interesting, I think, in recent years. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just just speaking um, uh, uh, as a Canadian, um, I think just reflecting on the two film screenings we had last month, uh, there are more contemporary documentaries about the Ainu people. Um, but the feedback and the response and, and the amount of people who tuned into our online screenings, I think, is is a great um, representation of, of the, the 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 consumption, the growing consumption, as you mentioned, of Ainu culture uh, around the world. Um, which brings me, you know, I, I kind of that that kind of growth um, brings me to to my next question, which is back to uh, Kayano Shigeru um, and Kayano's legacy. Um, uh, you mentioned different ways that contemporary Ainu communities have, have chosen to uh, learn more about their own culture and recover their own culture, um, which I see is, is a great, it's going in a positive trend and positive direction. Um, but what do you see from your opinion are the current main challenges of Ainu people and Ainu uh, communities um, 
in their efforts to recover their language, recover their culture, recover their customs. Um, you know, even with modern technology and, and, and growing interest, what do you think are, are the greatest challenges today for, for the Ainu people? Yeah, thank you very much. Another very interesting question uh, and very important. Um, challenges, probably the, the first, uh, main, the main challenge will be that they are no, no native speakers anymore. Um, although, having said that, there is a growing number of people who are learning an Ainu language. So no native speakers available, but more people who are able to uh, to speak in Ainu language, even if it's as a second language, because they have they are learning it and they are engaging in teaching it to the ne to the next generations. Although the problem was that the the linguist came to the research of the production, for example, of of the Ainu language dictionaries came very late in the nineteen in, during the nineties. Um, so. Usually, the Ainu language has been studied as a dead language, um, which is uh, which is very sad. So it is a, a big challenge, I think. Um, another challenge is, is is probably common to all the minority cultures across the across the world, and is how, as a member of a of a community, you identify yourself. Um, and this is not an easy question. I mean. Because essentialist approaches to culture is always very problematic. In other words, um, so uh, should all the Ainu community um, be engaged in, you know, the, the production of traditional elements such as Ainu spoon? So only because you are able to produce an Ainu spoon, uh, you are you can say that you are an Ainu, or can you can you be interested in other things like rock and roll or you know, and uh, contemporary, I don't know, films, or can you do other things, or can you do avant-garde art and still be regarded as Ainu? This is the same as, as asking, I don't know, can you be Japanese and, and not knowing anything about the geisha culture or, or samurai culture? You know, this is, um, uh, and also cultures have never been isolated. They have always developed, uh, developed and evolved and, and interacted with other cultures. So, one challenge is, I would say, for the I communities is developing a, a mature kind of approach to their own culture and welcoming all approaches to Ainu culture. In other words, uh, the, the, the Ainu cultural like institutions, I think they should also welcome like new, like more like modern kind of approaches to their own culture. So, uh, so in other words, acknowledging how their own culture is evolving and for example, welcoming exhibitions on Ainu avant-garde art, for example. What Ainu avant-garde art means is another question. Probably it's a matter of self-identification. So as long as a, a person uh, claims that they are Ainu, they should be regarded as Ainu. Because this is also quite com a complex issue. Uh, who, I mean, who, uh, who, who is an Ainu? It's, an, it's not an easy question. Because some people are descendants of, uh, you know, uh, of, of other Ainu, but they don't claim to be Ainu. And Ainu, they they live life as a, as a modern Japanese. But other people who might have like a, an Ainu grandmother, they claim to be Ainu. Um, so as I, that's why I said, as I said before, an ethnic approach is problematic because already Ainu community is very mixed with the rest of the Japanese. So it's really a matter of self identification. Um, but I think it's, it's completely fine. Um, and but if the Aino community is able to welcome, to embrace this complexity uh, in the modern world, that is going to be a, a way in which they can continue. If they keep an essentialist approach to rejecting other approaches and keeping, you know, only those activities that are closely linked to, to the tradition as such, as kept in before Meiji period, that is a, a limited kind of perspective, I would say, to what Ainu culture is, because um, what we consider as Ainu culture, I mean, traditional culture, is something that was created before Meiji period. So it's already more than 150 years before. Um, so, you know, being too much limited to these views, I think it's kind of problematic, but this is a global problem. It's not really <laughs> unrestricted to the Ainu community, I would say. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree with, with, with that. Um, 
to that note, I, I can wrap up with this final question. Um, as you mentioned, it, it is it is a, a an issue that is beyond the the Ainu people. It, it is a global issue. Um, how do you think the the North American audience will respond to to the Himeta films that we, we were about to show? Um, how do you how do you hope uh, the North American audience can learn possibly about the lands that they are on um, when mm. when engaging and learning more about the Ainu? as the interest of the Ainu grows globally? Mm. Well, I hope, uh, I mean, that's a very interesting question because quite often when we discussed Ainu or Japanese problems, they are also helping us to discuss other problems back home in other in different contexts, which are maybe, you know, maybe going through similar issues. For example, in the case of, of how to preserve and promote minority cultures. Uh, of course, the U.S., Canada have their own uh, minorities, their own native uh, uh, indigenous people. Um, so similarities, difference may be raised. But more importantly for me, raise, I mean, having this kind of presentation and this kind of discussions within, a, within the Japanese, within the Japan Foundation or, or whether within institutions for the promotion of Japanese studies is very interesting and very useful because th this is also helping us uh, scholars and and the wider audience to understand uh, the complexity of Japanese culture um, so you know um, you know uh, uh, understanding that Japanese society is not homogeneous as has never have been is diverse just like any other culture and society in the world and the Ainu people is just an example of that uh, I mean, we can talk about many other kind of minorities, like sexual, gender minorities, LGBT, uh, the, you know, immigrants, Chinese, Taiwanese, Philippines. Uh, so in that sense, Japanese society is not different from other societies. But there was always this problem of, of, of the official political discourses insisting in Japan as a homogeneous nation and, and problematic and problematic views of, of, of Japan. So. Um, I hope this presentation helps the audience to see uh, well the diversity of Japanese culture and have like a wider, you know, see uh, addressing Japan, Japanese culture from a wider perspective. So hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree again. Um, and yeah, I, I want to, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Santino, for, for, for your presentation and, and uh, for answering all these questions at the end. Um, I just want to remind the audience um, who's watching that um, we are showing uh, three films from uh, director Himena Tadayoshi online from Friday, September 2nd to September 4th, North America wide, and it is for free. Um, yeah, thank you once again, Dr. Sentineau. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.